Lynn Joyner is a, an Emmy-winning journalist. You have, uh, if you haven't, if, I know there are a lot of her friends here. Uh, for those that don't know, you have seen her work on CNN, ABC, and uh, CBS. Uh, she has covered major events, particularly in China. Back in 1975, she traveled to China. She was the only American journalist in China when Zhou Enlai died, and, and the only one to be able to report there about his death, cover his death live from China at the time. Shortly thereafter, she met a, a foreign service officer, John Service and his wife, at a, at a conference there. They had some mutual professional interests, but that developed into a personal friendship. And because of that friendship, Service told her stories about his conversation with Chairman Mao and during World War II. And that started Lynn thinking about his service, uh, his service to his country, his career. Uh, and so she started reading his confidential oral history. She then turned to the Freedom of Information Act to gain access to previously unpublished government documents. She supplemented that with extensive interviews and other documentation. And the result was a 10, year, 10 years of research and writing that resulted in the Honorable Survivor. Please join me in welcoming Lynn Joyner. Thank you for coming in this rain. It's uh, quite, quite something, and I appreciate it very, very much. Um, uh, I am delighted to be here at the Carter Library and Museum, and you're going to see me hopping around a little bit tonight. I'll start up here. I have to go back there to run the slideshow because I come out of a TV background, I do believe a picture is sometimes worth a thousand words. And all the photographs I'm going to show you are in the book. And they're also at my website, which has even additional photographs. Uh, so at www Honorable Survivor, you'll be able to see a lot of photographs uh, in a good formatted frame. We have a little difficulty because this projector is for movies and not for my MacBook, but we're going to make it work, and uh, you can thumb through the book out there and look and see the pictures if someone's head is cut off. But um, I really am delighted to be here because 30 years ago, I was at the White House when President Jimmy Carter welcomed Deng Xiaoping from China to officially sign the formal documents that were necessary to establish normal diplomatic relations between our two countries. I was only 12 years old at the time. And I just wanted you to know that. Um, <laughs> the signing of official diplomatic relations came seven years after the historic handshake between Mao and Chairman, between Chairman Mao and President Nixon in Beijing. And one of the reasons was the sticky issue of Taiwan. And we still have a sticky issue of Taiwan as our president uh, embarks on his first state visit to Beijing next month. There are a lot of items on his agenda, including the sticky wicket of improving military relations between our two countries while the United States continues to sell defensive military equipment and fighter jets to Taiwan. Now, both the Taiwan people and uh, the, the government on Taiwan and the government in the People's Republic believe there is one China, and that's what the U.S. said during the Shanghai Community K that was signed in 1972 that finally broke through the animosity between the two countries. So um, it continues to be a, a dilemma for America over the two Chinas, and I'm hoping that my book will help explain how it all began. Uh, and I also think, and some of the people who've read my book, like the former Assistant Secretary of State uh, for East Asian Affairs, Susan Shirk, that Jack Service's story has resonance today in trouble spots like Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and so forth. Uh, and his story is part of the, come on in, if you'd like, or throw the tomatoes from there, I don't care. Uh, but it is part of the continuing tangle over China, and it's important uh, to try to understand it. That's what I'm going to try and do in the book. 
And now I'm going to have to switch from up here to back there so I can run the computer and get the show on the road. And I will be delighted to uh, answer your questions. And Tony, the only thing I want to say is that we're starting at 15 after 7 by my watch. So I'm hoping that the clock only starts now on my talk. And anybody who has to leave because of the lousy weather, I understand. But I hope to leave you spellbound. I hope you like my bamboo. Yeah. <laughs> OK, I'm ready to get the show on the road. I have uh, some excerpts from the book I want to read to you as I go along. So I had to spread them out on the floor so I can grab them when we need them. And I hope everybody doesn't mind a little bit of a cozy evening around the fireplace, listening to the rain outside and watching a fascinating slideshow and hearing about an amazing story. So we begin here. Uh, and unfortunately, you can't see all of it, but that's all right. You can see enough of it. And the whole point is to say that this story of what happened to John Service is set against a backdrop of war, revolution, romance, international intrigue, and Washington skullduggery. That, to me, just proves that fact is stranger than fiction. Now, Tony just mentioned that we were friends, and I have to start there. This is a picture of me with John Service on the Great Wall in China from 1980. And even though we were friends, I want to assure you I am a trained investigative journalist, and I led where the trail led me. It took four years to pry open some documents at the FBI and the State Department Security Office. Um, and I found out things that Jack Service never knew, and I found out things that he chose not to remember. But his ordeal lasted for many years, from 1945 until 1972, when Nixon shook Mao's hands. And up at the top, it says, how the FBI links six in the Amerasia case. And you'll hear more about the Amerasia case as we go along. But this is the 60th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic. John Service was born in Sichuan in Chengdu uh, back in 1909. And in those days, um, somebody has my bag. And I have to stop just for a second because I need my pointer. So it's a very informal gathering tonight. I'm sorry. I don't know. It walked away. To get to where he, his parents started the YMCA in Chengdu, you came by ship to Shanghai. And then you had to take this Yangtze River trip and transfer boats and go up through the gorges. It took four months to get here to Chongqing. And then from there, you had to travel overland. And this is the way you traveled in the early 20th century. By the time John Service was 10, he refused to be carried on the shoulders of human beings, and he walked alongside his father 250 miles, making 25 miles a day. His baby sister, who was born and uh, before the services came to China, died on the trip. But there were three boys who were born and raised in this amazing medieval town by Robert and Grace Service. And they lived in this privileged sort of foreign community made up mainly of missionaries and also uh, the diplomats uh, amidst uh, the war and revolution, the disintegration of the last dynasty, the warlord period, the effort to try and create a centralized uh, Chinese government and root out all the foreigners and get China back for the Chinese. He uh, married his college sweetheart, Caroline, uh, and she came all by herself once he finally got a job as a lowly clerk in the uh, consulate out in Yunnan Fu, which we now know as Kunming in Yunnan province. And uh, she arrived and braved getting there, and she hated it. She really suffered from terrible culture shock, the stench of sweet, sickly opium from the opium dens, the bodies of baby girls. 
it was too much, and she fled back to Shanghai, where her, his parents by that point had moved, where uh, his father was uh, a regional secretary for the YMCA. But eventually, Caroline learned to love it, and she told me wonderful stories when Jack was assigned to Beijing for three years of language training, how they, uh, we stayed together at the Beijing Hotel once, and she told me about the wonderful dancing parties on the rooftop of the Beijing Hotel during the 30s. Anyway, war came, and it came sooner to China than it did to America. The Japanese, as you probably remember or know from your history books, invaded and took over Manchuria and created a puppet regime there, and then over the course of the 30s kept inching closer and closer into territory of, the, of China directly. The point being is that by 1940, after Caroline and Jack Service had two little children, uh, they were bombing Shanghai, where Service served at our consulate in occupied Shanghai, and all American dependents were evacuated. As soon as he got his widowed mother and his family safely out of Shanghai on a boat, Service volunteered for hazardous duty in the uh, wartime capital of last resort for the nationalist Chinese, way up the Yangtze River in Chongqing, that town I pointed out before. And every day from 1937 to 42, there were daily bombing raids by the Japanese, and the Chinese had no air force. And that's where Claire Chenault started to come to the rescue with the Flying Tigers. You may have seen that old movie. But anyway, there was a new... Uh, a new ambassador who, who came a few months after service came. And so even though there were bombing raids every day, they all had to dress up in their best <laughs> tucks and tails and go down these ladder streets, which are typical in China, in Chongqing. But service didn't have a top hat, so he borrowed one from a British uh, diplomat and stuffed it with newspaper to make it fit. The ambassador quickly learned that Service was an extraordinary foreign service officer, and as he said, he would talk to anyone and everyone trying to figure out this puzzle of China that lay before us. China was a patchwork quilt of different territories controlled by different forces. There were the nationalists. There was this huge area controlled by the occupying Japanese army. There were warlords who would sell their services and their armies to the highest bidder. And then there was this mysterious group of guerrillas under Mao Zedong up in the northwest central part of China that nobody really knew much about at all. But to give you an idea of how difficult modern warfare was in the war, if you look down here, you'll see these drums that are fuel. And they have to be siphoned off into five-gallon drums and then climb up the ladder up onto the wing and use a funnel to fill the wing fuel tanks. And all of this fuel and all of the supplies to fight the war were brought in over what was euphemistically called the hump, these 29,000 foot high Himalayan mountains, which served as the back door into China because the Japanese controlled the whole east and south coast of China. And it was very difficult and many Americans lost their lives when their planes iced up because they could barely get that high and get over the mountains. And many of the Americans who worked in China were very upset when they'd find a lot of the supplies that had been so courageously brought into China being sold on the black market by avaricious officials and military officers of the Guomindang. Service in his travels around the country found that Roosevelt cloth, this donated clo cloth that was to help make uh, clothes for the children in orphanages was being, so, was being dyed and sold in the best tailor shops. Um, he was also invited to go up to a new oil field, a secret oil field that the nationalists had way up in the northwest of China. He was the only American who went with a group of uh, engineers and three Chinese journalists. And it was an eight-week trip in a bumpy little bus and he broke through the cocoon he had lived in and got to know these Chinese on a personal basis. They were intelligent, cultured men, and uh, they allowed him to call them by their first name. And 
It was on this trip that he learned about a famine in one of the provinces that had basically been man-made because of the draconian uh, taxes on peasants during a huge drought. So the taxes kept going up even though the fields could only produce less and less. But it was, I want to read you a little passage from the book about this trip. During the trip, Service earned the respect and trust of his traveling companions, and he discovered the depth of their disenchantment with the increasingly repressive nationalist regime and their fears for the future. All assumed that the U.S. would easily defeat Japan and that Chiang Kai-shek would then renew his civil war against the communists. As a result of these candid conversations, another Chinese puzzle piece suddenly fell into place for the diplomat. Zhang's reluctance to embrace General Stilwell's plan for a strong counteroffensive might reflect his desire to preserve his troops and stockpile American arms and equipment for a renewed battle against, his, against the communists. And until American observers could reach communist-controlled areas to assess their capabilities, the China puzzle would never be fully understood. I felt that I had a special kind of linkage and insight, service later observed. Was this the seed of hubris? Possibly. So it was rather interesting. Um, because the political landscape in China and with the allies, the British and uh, so forth, uh, it was very uh, difficult to fathom what was really going on. And st service and three other uh, diplomats, foreign service officers, got assigned to General uh, Vinegar Joe Stilwell's staff. And behind him in this photograph is General Claire Chenault of uh, Flying Tiger fame. And throughout the war, there were all these fights and divisions over the precious land, the, the supply route over the hump. Who would get the supplies? Stilwell, who wanted to mount a ground offensive, or General Chenault, who felt that if he just had enough supplies and aircraft, he could bomb the Japanese and the war would be over quickly. Service was assigned to Stilwell's staff and two of his most important jobs were to brief uh, war correspondents and give them background on what was really going on in China away from the propaganda being spewed out by uh, many of the government officials. And his other job was to be liaison to the Chinese communists because the communists were allowed to have an office in Chongqing but Stilwell had to walk the tightrope politically and not have any of his officers go there. So Service, who was not a, an army officer, but a diplomat, wearing a, a, a uniform without any rankings on it, he was assigned to that role. By um, 1943, when he came back from his travels with his Chinese uh, uh, friends and had discovered that that oil field way in the northwest was too far away that if America airlifted a refinery in there they could refine the uh, oil and make gasoline but by the time they drove it down to where the war fronts were they'd have used up all the gas and he also uh, sent a report back saying you know uh, we need to find out if the Chinese communists are for real because if what we hear about them um, is true, then they might be a serious competitor to uh, Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists. And, and if, the, if civil war broke out while we're trying to fight the Japanese, it wouldn't be very good uh, for our war effort. So he was concerned about America's war effort. In December of 45, FDR met for the first time Chiang Kai-shek and his wife, Madam Zhang, who had gone to Wellesley. Here is uh, Churchill, behind him is Eisenhower, and on the other side of uh, Roosevelt in the back is General Stilwell. Well, after they met with um, Chiang Kai-shek and tried to urge him to commit troops to General Stilwell's counteroffensive, and he kept changing his mind and waffling back and forth, FDR became disenchanted with him. He then left Cairo and went to Tehran for a meeting with another ally that he had never met, and that was Stalin. And he came away from that meeting thinking he had met a man he could do business with, with and that Chiang Kai-shek was pretty unreliable. And uh, he met again with Stilwell when he returned to Cairo on his way home, and uh, 
heard more complaints about how uh, the, the, the Chinese soldiers were being uh, badly taken care of. They weren't, their rations were being sold on the black market, so they were all malnourished. And so Roosevelt said to Stilwell, well, look for some other man or group to carry on. Well, eight months later, there was a huge offensive by the Japanese, and FDR sent a secret eyes-only cable to Chiang Kai-shek because he still was not committing his troops to the counter-offensive. And guess who was the messenger of this secret eyes-only cable? None other than John Service. Uh, because he spoke good Chinese, and the Americans were getting tired of the fact that Madame Zhang or one of her Harvard-educated brothers uh, would do the translation of any messages that came in uh, and soften them. And sometimes they didn't even deliver them if they thought they were too rough for Chiang Kai-shek to hear. So in this case, uh, Stilwell's uh, commander, uh, chief of staff, said to his service, hey, you come with me, and I want you to do the translation. And what the blunt message said was, my God, as we are facing disaster with this uh, offensive by the Japanese, you have to, I want you, I want you, to, I want to suggest very strongly that you appoint Stilwell to be the commander of all allied forces in China, and that meant even the communist Chinese who were his bitter rivals. Well, you can imagine that this great man of China did not look kindly on a 32, 33-year-old skinny, low-level diplomat giving him this kind of a message. And as Service later said, it was just another nail in his coffin. Um, but he was successful in getting uh, America to pressure Chiang Kai-shek to let him go with this man, Colonel David Barrett, and about 15 other American and military observers. Finally, uh, Chiang Kai-shek relented and let them go and fly behind enemy lines with fighter escort and land in Yan'an, which was the wartime stronghold of the communists. And it, this meant basically de facto regulation I'm sorry, de facto recognition of the other China. And it very much upset Chiang Kai-shek and was another nail in John Service's coffin. Um, because the other China was totally off the radar screen of Washington policymakers. Uh, and at that time, the army was eager to find um, forces willing and able to cooperate behind enemy lines against the Japanese. And so these gentlemen led this secret mission called the Dixie Mission. And uh, there were all kinds of, uh, cur there was a lot of curiosity on both sides. This is a young Mao Zedong. This is uh, Zhu Da, who was the commander in chief of the guerrillas, and various Americans, I won't bore you with their names. But uh, it had been 18 months since service had first urged the United States government to send people to assess their strengths and weaknesses and find out if they really had a fighting force that was worth anything. Um, and his first uh, report back, he said his first impression was that the um, communists seemed to remind him of uh, summer church conferences because it had the same tinge of smugness, self-righteousness, and conscious fellowship. Uh, and not too much sense of humor, but he did acknowledge that he felt, they all felt that they had come to a different country and were meeting a different people. The bodyguards, gendarmes, and claptrap of Chongqing officialdom are also completely lacking. Well, when they first landed, the plane had an accident. The, it was a bad airstrip. It had been built by Chevron before the war, and the propeller broke off and damaged the plane, and so the Chinese mobilized uh, workforces, and everybody joined in to volunteer, and so service decided the American Dixie Mission should help. So they go out to help, and all the peasants stop working and stare. They had never seen white men doing any physical labor, so they didn't stay long. During the three months service was there, here's Mao, here's uh, the bald-headed Barrett, this is service over here. They tried to get to know everything they could about the Chinese communists. Everything from their concept of this new kind of people's war to, uh, he reported on the Saturday night dances in the pear orchard where Mao's wife, a former actress named Zhang Jing, seemed almost ravishing compared to some of the other 
communist wives in their padded Mao suits. They were given briefings by guerrilla leaders who had assembled in Yan'an uh, because there was an important conference that was about to happen. This man was at one point Mao's chosen successor and he tried a coup in 1971 and his airplane was mysteriously shot down on its headed toward the Soviet Union. This is service sitting here. But service was allowed to interview anyone and everyone and Mao said to him the first night at dinner, you know, I want you to get to know us and you and I need to talk seriously but not for another month. I want you to get to know us and anybody uh, you need to talk to to find out about different topics, we will direct you and your men to talk to them. And uh, so what he learned and wrote back in his dispatches, and by the way, there's a wonderful book collection of his dispatches called Lost Chance in China, uh, John Service's wartime uh, dispatches, and you can find it on Google. But anyway, he, he found out that they said, they told him that they felt the key to their success was being able to do political indoctrination and organizing of the peasants into cooperatives with moderate economic and land reforms. They, they couldn't afford to uh, upset all the landlords because they, they were living off the land. They had been vanquished by the nationalists and they had to rebuild and so they, it was a very moderate program in the beginning but it was essential for the kind of guerrilla war and underground resistance that they were organizing against the Japanese invaders and service recognized that it really was a revolution and that he predicted if the nationalists did not go as far in reforms as the, as the communists, then the communists would become the dominant political force in China someday. There were all these meetings with the military and the guerrillas, and among the American military who were there were members of the OSS. The OSS was run out of the White House. It stood for Office of Strategic Services, and it became the precursor for the CIA. And there were embedded among the Dixie Mission a number of agents of the OSS who were eager to try to uh, develop a intelligence radio network, uh, train uh, guerrillas for sabotage work. They even did demonstrations of modern explosives uh, which just, and, and, and uh, weapons that just had the Chinese drooling. They used to try and buy bullets from the puppet troops of the Japanese because they didn't have many bullets. The way they would sabotage Japanese trains on the rail lines was to literally pry up the tracks with their bare hands and then these Americans come and go boom boom and show them how to do it. And there were plans to give the, uh, to outfit and train 20,000 guerrillas by the United States, set up saboteurs all the way into Tokyo and provide them with 100,000 assassin pistols. Service, after he'd been there for a few months, he endorsed this uh, plan to cooperate with them and to give proportionate aid directly to the communists, which was something John Guy Shek did not want to see happen. He also really met, these are the four top leaders of the Chinese communists, Young Mao, Zhou Enlai, who, as, I, as uh, uh, Tony mentioned, I, was, I reported on his death, Judah and Ye Jianying. Uh, a month after service got there, Mao called him to his cave. They lived in caves for defensive purposes because of the bombs from the Japanese in their early days there. And it started what turned out to be an eight-hour conversation between Mao and this young Foreign Service officer in which Mao made it clear that he wanted to cooperate with the U.S. Army and he didn't want to cross the... Uh, Americans and it was important for him to know what the Americans were thinking and what their policy was going to be. And he also expressed his, his concern. He didn't want uh, civil war to break out. He said, we won't start it, but if we're attacked, we will fight. But there's been enough bloodshed and if we can gain a political voice in a coalition government, then we'd rather do that because we're confident that we have the people behind us. He also said that he hoped that American businessmen would come and help rebuild and develop China in the post-war uh, era. And Service said, well, you know, a lot of capitalists would be very fearful of 
doing business with communists. And we know what happened in the 1920s when you ransacked Amer uh, foreign businesses. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, we've, we've actually considered changing our name. But once people got to know us, we decided people would understand that uh, we are a different brand of communists. Um, later, Service said he regretted not taking Mao's advice and flying back with the next supply plane to spread this word, to give this word to the ambassador in Chongqing and have it immediately radioed to Washington. Instead, he said, no, I'll stay, I have to stay here, but I'll, I'll, de I'll code the report. It'll be sent to Chongqing and get to Washington. Well, it took them two months to decode it in Chongqing. It sat on the desk. It didn't go to Washington for two months. And during those two months, some momentous decisions were made that sealed the fate of what turned out to be 27 years of animosity between Americans and communists. And during those years of bitterness, neither side ever spoke of the cooperative spirit that briefly flowered in Yan'an during, during the war years. The Chinese communists gave them these homespun wool uniform outfits to wear because it was cold there. And during the McCarthy era, they were considered, it was considered evidence that they were communist dupes. Now, while all that's going up in the remote area of Yan'an, lots of things are happening back in Chongqing and with the war effort. Um, because, again, Zhang started dragging his feet over allowing uh, this man to become the commander of all Chinese forces, uh, Roosevelt sent this debonair, mustachioed man named Patrick Hurley, he'd been a Secretary of War under Hoover, out to help smooth the way. And he didn't know anything about China. He didn't know that the last name is always, always comes first in Chinese. And so with Zhang Kai-shek's wife, he called her Mrs. Shek instead of Mrs. Zhang. And this is the man who then is uh, turned around by uh, Zhang Kai-shek and is, uh, decides that this is the wrong man for the job. And Zhang keeps saying, well, if you just get rid of this Vinegar Joe fella, I, everything will be smooth. And so he helps engineer the recall of Stilwell with Zhang. And when, uh, still, when service is up in Yan'an and hears the rumors from the pilot who lands uh, a little while later, he writes a very blunt and frank memo to Stilwell, who is his boss, because he's working for Stilwell in the Army. And he said, you know, we really should end the hollow pretense that China is unified and that we can talk only to Zhang. This puts the trump card in Zhang's hands. Well, later the FBI and anti-communist politicians will use that as what they consider evidence that uh, John Service is out to sabotage the nationalists, which is not what was going on at all. But more and more, um, Service felt that he was a man with a mission. He, he was recalled to Washington for talks and to explain about the other China soon after uh, Stilwell's recall. And uh, he wanted to urge uh, a different policy. While all of this is going on, his personal life took a turn. He met this beautiful wartime actress named Val Chow. His family had been uh, evacuated in 1940. Val and Jack Service met on a bus in the early uh, part of 1944, and it developed into a real romance. He wrote his wife saying, I want a divorce for the first time I'm in love. The ambassador said, don't be a damn fool. Live with her if you will, but don't divorce her. You can't continue in the foreign service with a foreign wife. And um, service had only one night in Yan, uh, he came back from Yan'an on his way to Washington, had one night with Val, promised her he'd come back a free man, and went off to brief America, uh, Washington and, and talk to his wife. Well, he, he saw his children. He realized he had responsibilities. He also realized he had a very important job as a diplomat and a foreign service officer, and he didn't want to throw that away. So he reconciled with his wife, and she quickly became pregnant. And he never wrote to Val Chow, and he never knew that he had left her pregnant. Meanwhile, back in Yan'an, uh, General Hurley, again, look how beautiful his tailored clothes are compared to these nice Chinese. Look at Mao. Um, he plays a surprise. He, 
pays a surprise visit. He's a, he's a lawyer. He thinks he can negotiate a peace settlement and bring together the nationalists and the Chinese in a coalition government and avoid civil war and get them both to fight with America against the Japanese. And FDR appoints him the ambassador and says uh, to his son, boy, I wish I had more Pat Hurley's. Um, if anyone can straighten out the mess of internal Chinese politics, he is the man. But he was wrong. Hurley made a mess. And even though he came and he listened to Mao's proposals for a, a peace settlement and thought they were so, so good and so fair, he said, do you mind if I help improve them? And he added some Lincoln-esque uh, prose about of the people, by the people, for the people. And then he takes it back to Chongqing, and the nationalist Chinese say, you've got to be kidding. We're not going to power share. And they offer a, a, a proposal that doesn't allow them, any, the communists, to have any stake in a government. And it's, it's for good reason, because they're scared. And um, nevertheless, uh, Ambassador Hurley, who likens the republic, likens the communists and the nationalists to his home state of Oklahoma, the political fights between the Democrats and the out-of-office uh, out Republicans. He says, the only difference between the Republicans and the communists is the communists have guns. So he orchestrates this photo op and uh, toast to peace as they start new peace talks, and he flies Mao from Yan'an to uh, Chongqing for this abortive effort that never could, it was still born from the beginning. But at the time that this unique and very rare photograph of the toast between Mao and Zhang with Hurley looking on proudly thinking he was going to win the Nobel Prize for Peace, if there were an award at that point, um, it, it, it isn't working. And while this is going on in China, this is going on in America. John Service has been arrested by the FBI. He, after his second visit uh, in um, Yan'an in the spring of 1945 when he was sent back uh, and he uh, was arrested because he had loaned some of his reports describing the conditions in, in the other China and, and what Mao had said uh, to an editor of a, a magazine called the Amerasia, which was an Asian journal. Um, and he had no idea that this man, Jaffe, was already under surveillance and investigation by the FBI, and that there were a couple of, um, there was a man from the Naval Intelligence and also a clerk, a civilian clerk at the State Department, who were leaking documents from the government to this man. And uh, I can't go into any details about it, but this case was the case that never died. And as a result of this case, a web of suspicion grew around John's service that he fought to extricate himself from for the rest of his life. And they were arrested for conspiracy to commit espionage. And he wrote a letter from jail that night to his mother saying, you know, I'm innocent of these charges. I don't know these people, but a trial may be necessary. But hold your head up high. The service escutcheon will not be tarnished. He got uh, help from some uh, higher-ups at the State Department and people at the White House to get a good lawyer. And unbeknownst to John's service, the free advice he got cost more than he bargained for. And uh, this fellow on the right started peddling his influence and came to the attention of none other than J. Edgar Hoover, who discovered through wiretaps that had been ordered by the Truman uh, White House that um, the influence peddler had uh, called and talked to justice official, uh, high officials in the Justice Department about John Service and the fact that he, was, uh, he had just come in on the tail end of this thing and really wasn't part of this group. Uh, but it made Hoover very suspicious and a, and a file was kept on John Service until Nixon's trip to China in 1972. And he was basically the victim of circumstantial evidence and guilt by association and got caught in a, in a turf war between the FBI and the Justice Department because the Justice Department uh, said that one reason 
the case never went to trial was because the FBI had bungled the investigation and illegally wiretapped and hidden an illegal microphone in the editor's uh, hotel room and so on and so forth. And uh, so uh, Hoover uh, suspected a white wash and a cover-up, and he started leaking information to the press and politicians. And in, by 1950, when we were totally disillusioned, when our wartime ally, Uncle Joe, Stalin, and the Soviets were now our implacable enemy in the new Cold War, uh, Hoover found a great ally in this man, Doc, uh, Senator Joseph McCarthy. Uh, who was aided also by the Nationalist Chinese Secret Police and the uh, anti-communist politicians who wanted desperately to get the Democrats out of the White House. They'd been there since 1932, you might remember. And he uh, was part of an effort on Lincoln Day uh, in 1950 uh, to go out in the country uh, at the behest of the GOP chairman to... Um, speak on the topic of uh, conspiracy and traitors subversion in the government. And so in Wheeling, West Virginia, he made a famous speech or an infamous speech in which he held up a little booklet and said, I have in my hand the name of 205 card-carrying communists and they're working in the Dean Acheson's State Department. Well, this caused uh, a lot of concern. Uh, he only named four people, and the first one he named was none other than John Service. And I'll quote just a little bit from that speech. He said, Service sent official reports back to the State Department urging that we torpedo our ally John Kai-shek and stating in unqualified terms, and I quote, that communism was the only hope of China. Later this man, John Service, and please remember that name, ladies and gentlemen, was picked up by the FBI for turning over to the communists secret State Department information. Strangely, however, he was never prosecuted. Today, ladies and gentlemen, this man, Service, is on his way to represent the State Department and Atchison in Calcutta, by far and away the most important listening post in the Far East. Well, when he repeated this speech over and over again across the country, by the time he came back to Washington, it was big news, the media was all over it, and he was called to explain and tell who these 205 names were on the floor of the Senate. He, he used to be a boxer, and he fainted his way through an eight-hour talk, but he mentioned Jack Service quite a bit in that speech. And when he did, the Service family was on the Pacific Ocean, in a, were sailing across the Pacific Ocean on a freighter on their way to India, which was going to be Service's next post. And one night, they were having dinner with the uh, captain when one of the crewmen came in and interrupted and said, is your name John Stewart Service? And Jack Service said, yes. He said, well, you better come up to the radio room. There's some senator talking about you. And that's how they learned that he was being attacked by none other than Joseph McCarthy. And I'd like to uh, tell you, I'd like to read you a little excerpt at this point, because what happened is every night they heard a little bit more on the scratchy radio, it was a shortwave radio, and there was always some little news about service and McCarthy. And finally a cable arrived on the ship from the State Department ordering service to get off the ship in Yokohama and report back to Washington to answer questions. And the family continued on the ship to India, optimistically, they all thought that he could go clear it up in a few weeks and fly to India and maybe even be on, be on the docks when the ship uh, came into India a month later. Instead, the family, Carolyn, son Robert, daughter Virginia, and Phil, young Philip, were stranded in limbo in India for over a year while this John Service went through double jeopardy loyalty investigations before the Senate subcommittee of the Foreign Relations Committee and by the uh, Loyalty and Security Board of the State Department. But I'm jumping ahead and I want to read you what uh, Caroline wrote in a letter to her parents as they sailed off and hoped that Jack would be able to clear things up in a few weeks. She wrote, 
This should be the final foray of Jack's bitter enemies and everything should be at last cleared up. And the insinuations and the lies and the cruel persecution and the terrible thing of accusing a man of something he did not do and then never giving him a chance to defend himself should be over. Caroline Service wrote her parents in a long plaintive letter from Yokohama. We've had five years of it and that is enough and too much. And all because he and others had the courage to report the truth from China. Wistfully, she continued, if only we were still in Washington, all of this should have been cleared up then. Here we sit in the Pacific Ocean, able to do absolutely nothing, caught between the sea and the sky. So Service was caught in these uh, investigations, and he was uh, asked to explain, it because certain of his reports or little tiny snippets of his reports were leaked to the press by the FBI and by McCarthy. What he, did he mean that the communists were, dem, democ were democratic? And he said, well, you know, it's really not fair to take a brief excerpt out of context. These are confidential reports written for professionals in the State Department who would understand that it's, it's a shortcut way of using the word democracy in a comparative sense as compared to conditions with the nationalist Chinese, not as compared to American democracy. By the way, while they were, while his family was on the ship sailing to India, Caroline was so upset and so worried about what was going on in America with the witch hunt. There were loyalty oaths that people had to have to get jobs. She took John Service's notebooks from Yan'an and threw them overboard. And he did not know it for a year until she got back to Washington. And when I interviewed him, I said, well, how did you feel? What did you say? Weren't you angry? And he said, well, there was nothing I could do. It was gone. So one reason he never really wrote extensively about that period was his notebooks ended up on the bottom of the sea. He was fired. He fought a court battle. It took seven years. But at the, if you can read the headline, John Stewart's service wrongfully dismissed ex-diplomat a McCarthy target wins 8-0 to zero a Supreme Court ruling. This happened in 1957. In the meantime, he couldn't, have, he couldn't get a job at first when he was fired for not disloyalty, what they called doubtful loyalty. And he wasn't fired as a result of those loyalty and hearings that I showed you, there was another tier of loyalty investigation by what was Truman's Loyalty Review Board. And the review board had been set up to be a court of last resort for any federal employee who had been accused of disloyalty so that they could have a chance to appeal and reverse the negative and be investigated and find out if there really was something. In Service's case, both of those investigative bodies had found him innocent of the charges and had, he had proved and explained what his role had been. And uh, the fact that he had been cleared by the grand jury in the Amerasia case five years before. But uh, the review board, under political pressure of the times, reversed it and accused him of doubtful loyalty. Well, he finally won reinstatement. Nevertheless, the security goons, the anti-communist politicians, and oh yes, the Nationalist Secret Police and Intelligence Agencies neutralized his career. As a matter of fact, I discovered in my confidential documents that one of the main reasons he was fired was because the Nationalists spread slanderous uh, disinformation that he had fathered an illegitimate child by his Soviet spy lover. Nevertheless, by 1971, both China and the U.S., for their own reasons, mainly their concerns over the Soviet Union, decided to try to break through and have better relations. And John Service was invited back to the land of his birth by Zhou Enlai as a signal to the U.S. they wanted better relations. He got there eight months before uh, Nixon. He met secretly with Kissinger on one of his uh, trips to arrange, make all the arrangements for Nixon's trips. They met secretly in Beijing. N Kissinger asked him how serious the uh, Chinese were about tai the Taiwan issue. Uh, and Service said, this is non-negotiable. You're going to have to break relations with 
the Republic of China if you want to have relations with the People's Republic. And Kissinger said, well, my people tell me it's just a bargaining chip. And he said, no, it isn't. Anyway, by the time Kissinger went with Nixon for this historic handshake, he had, already, he had said to uh, uh, Service, would you mind coming to San Clemente to, to talk to uh, Nixon? Because when he said, when, when uh, Service was saying, no, this is, this is not a bargaining chip. As a matter of fact, Mao told me when I was in Yan'an, and Kissinger stopped him and said, you talked with Mao? And so Service said, yeah. And he said, well, would you come to San Clemente? Well, he never got the call to go to San Clemente. And um, he had checked on uh, uh, service when he got home. And I interviewed one of Kissinger's former aides. And I mentioned in the book that the aide explained to me that the US-China negotiations were so delicate, they had to be extremely careful not to inflame the China lobby, even if it meant not talking to the only American diplomat who had ever had substantive talks with Chairman Mao before Nixon. Nevertheless, by the end of his life, he was polishing the escutcheon, and he was awarded many honorary degrees. He was profiled in the New, York Time, New Yorker. He was on the cover of Parade magazine when Nixon met Mao, and he wrote articles about his, trip to ch his return to China for the New York <coughs> Times. And he, here he's, getting, he's in his robes having gotten an honorary degree, and next to him is his wife Caroline, and next to her is the actress Val Chow. And if you'd like to know how that all happened, you have to read my book. <laughs> so I think I will end it now and come up and take your questions. For over two or 3,000 uh, years, uh, peasants didn't amount to much. They weren't really considered humans, I guess, is one way. They were tied to the land. They couldn't own the land. And they worked like serfs almost. And they were always fearful of the government, and they were always fearful of armies. Um, and the chaos of China, you just cannot imagine unless you've done some reading about it. Um, and the, uh, the decay of the uh, dynasties and so forth. So along comes uh, Mao and the communists. And I have to go back a little bit to tell you that in the 1920s, the nationalists and the communists were allies. And together, they had a united front to try to move against all the warlords who had carved up the country along with the imperialist powers. There were these treaty ports. And in the treaty ports, the foreign governments, the British, the French, the Germans, the Japanese, and the Americans, could use their own laws for per prosecution of their citizens. The Chinese didn't have jurisdiction. It's a very strange situation that occurred there. And so all Chinese wanted to finally uh, get rid of this sick man of Asia image of China and take back their country from the imperialists and from the warlords. And uh, one of the few countries that had had a revolution of serfs was the Soviet Union. And so it became a model for many aspiring nationalists all over the world. Um, and so the model for the political structure of both the nationalists and the Chinese became the Soviet model, which is one reason they're both sort of closed. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Stalin instructed the, the communists to join the nationalists and then take it over from the inside and squeeze the lemons when the time came. Sent uh, these uh, very uh, Marxist-trained Stalinist uh, advisors to work with both of them, but Chiang Kai-shek uh, realized that he didn't want to be, I, I don't want to go into this too much, that's why I'm hesitating to give you all this history. Bottom line, there was a schism, there was a um, huge massacre of the uh, communists in Shanghai, and they were trying to follow the uh, Marx industrial revolutionary model. Uh, but the problem was China wasn't an industrial European country. It was a country with 90% uh, peasants who were tied to their little traditional villages, working their tiny plots with back-breaking work. And so it didn't work. And the uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's forces scattered uh, the red bandits and then hounded them for the next 10 years, trying to exterminate them. And so out of desperate necessity, 
Uh, Mao, who was not one of the leaders in the beginning, he was one of the originators of the party, but he wasn't the leader. They were more doctrinaire trained by Moscow. He realized the only way they could survive is if they could get the support of the people and if they treated the people with respect. So when they were on this huge, what they call the long march, but was a desperate escape from the uh, nationalists, they would need to get food and uh, some medicine for their wounded. And so they would go in and offer to pay. Now, no peasant had ever been paid by an army. They were raped and pillaged and so forth. So this was the change. And also, they started political indoctrination and organizing them into co-ops to um, weave cloth to uh, the army. The, the communist guerrillas would help in the harvesting of crops because everybody had to eat and they had to share the, what they could. And they had a very strong sense of self-reliance. And this was in sharp contrast to centuries of, of China. So that was the key that was his contribution to a new kind of uh, communism. And the problem was, you know, American policymakers, their only experience had been with Uncle Joe Stalin. And, and the Sovietologists had only had experience with a very closed society uh, where they weren't allowed to travel freely like the Dixie Mission could within um, the communist areas. And uh, they, they couldn't believe that they just thought service was naive. He was, he was very innocent, he, he, but he, what he saw, he reported. And that's all I want to say about it. I'm not making judgments. But you've got to read the book to understand that whole scene. But um, it's, what I try to do is not be boring, but try to show you how our, our world is a convergence of cataclysmic events, um, people, personalities, and forces that come together, domestic politics, international intrigue, Washington skullduggery, and guess what? It goes on today. <laughs> and I've just written a draft of an op-ed piece that I've called um, Scapegoats Then and Now. And I don't have it placed or I'd tell you where to look for it, but I really do believe there's resonance and there are lessons to be learned. But it's a rich fabric that we weave. And there are ways that you can use one man's amazing story. Uh, he was in a unique position and became a lightning rod for a number of various forces. Uh, and, and that's why I found it worth spending 10 years of my life working on it. Other questions? Well, I am of the 1960s generation and the anti-war generation. And I think I see some colleagues here. Uh, we are a very forgiving people. Uh, I frankly am mad as hell about lots of different things. We didn't talk about bonuses, did we? Uh, but I don't think our country is revolutionary. So I doubt it. Um, but um, I, I share your pain. It's an excellent comment that uh, part of the revolution by the communists was that soldiers who had been the vermin that sucked the blood of the peasants uh, and were scum uh, had been learned had learned that they had this was what I was saying they had to swim them you know they were like fish in the sea and they had to be able to get the support of the peasants and you can't get the support if you're abusing them and if you're uh, taking their stuff and not paying for it and so there was a whole re-education process that went on and so that the this was what made Tiananmen such a tragic experience for many in China. And I, I meant to mention this, but Tony gave such a nice uh, introduction about the fact I had been friends with service, I forgot to mention it. I was with John and Carolyn service the day that the announcement was made that a final normalization was going to happen. This was in December of 78. He uh, bought a bottle of champagne. And we toasted the friendship of the Chinese people and the American people. And that was the first time he kind of sat back and told me about these long conversations in the caves in Yan'an with Mao and these other leaders. I went, oh my god. Um, I had studied a little bit at Cornell about him, but this is when I got to sit there and listen to him talk. And then again, in 1989, June 4th to be exact, I had been invited to their home for lunch. 
and we watched the tanks rolling through Tiananmen on the television set. And he expressed a great sadness and disappointment in the evolution of this very promising uh, peasant revolution that he had seen in China in the 1940s. And there, there, there's been a debate among historians for many decades now about was there a lost chance in China in this critical period from summer of 44 through uh, 45 when the Americans and the communists were getting to know something about each other. Um, and I don't take sides. I just report what I find. But I will tell you that one of the things that Barbara Tuchman said is had we uh, taken the urgings of service and other China hands to reevaluate our policy and maybe not put the Trump card in Chiang Kai-shek's hands but work with both of the Chinas, she said the end result could not possibly have been any worse. And we might have avoided the misunderstanding that led the Chinese to come into the Korean War against us. We might not have had that war. We might also and not have Vietnam. Might not have had, but I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm quoting her, because I'm not a historian. Uh, but I will tell you that McNamara, in his book about mistakes made in the Vietnam War, it's called Retrospective, uh, he at one point says, you know, if only old China hands like John Service had still been in the State Department, perhaps I wouldn't have misperceived the Chinese intentions. Well, Bob McNamara, that's fine for you to say, but you could have picked up the phone and called him. He was working at the Center for Chinese Studies in Berkeley. It's a total call, but from, you know, it's not that expensive. But I mean, uh, what we have to do is learn from the past. And it's something we don't seem to be very good at doing. I will tell you one other thing, um, uh, just because I want to make sure you understand this. Uh, service died 10 years ago. This would be his 100th birthday year. So I feel it's very auspicious that the publication has come on the 30th anniversary of Jimmy Carter signing normalized relations with the Chinese, the 60th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic, and the 100th anniversary of um, John Service's uh, birth. Other questions? He once said that a revolution is not a dinner party. I think that's the best <laughs> I can come up with on the one hand. On the other hand, we have no, sitting in comfortable America, it's hard to know the chaos of China and the ruthlessness of pretty much every character you can name on the, on the field at that time. The other thing you have to understand and why, you know, you may think, oh my God, this Dixie mission and this guy Jack Service, they are totally naive. They didn't understand this hardcore China communist thing. Well, it turns out that between 1936, when after this long retreat and they ended up in Yan'an in Shanxi province area, um, in the middle of that retreat, there was this big battle over who would lead the Communist Party. Would it be the more doctrinaire Marxist, uh, Moscow trained, or this indigenous, we've got to get the peasants behind us if we're going to survive, pragmatic thing. Uh, by the time they got up to Yan'an and they became more self-reliant and they grew their own food and weaved their own yarn and made their own clothes and Mao grew his own tobacco and so forth, he, th he did a lot of writing. A lot of his writing was up there uh, on the, in his theory, his theory, and so that was the birth of this uh, Mao Zedong thought. And uh, by the time the Americans arrived in 44, they'd been there eight years. There'd been a lot of purging. There had been a lot of political indoctrination and organizing. For example, the art, a lot of artists, liberal artists who were under repression in other parts of China flocked up there. And all of a sudden, they're being put in intellectual straitjackets too to serve the people that the revolutionary cause demanded everyone subdue their own individualism for the greater good of pushing for this revolution and changing China and making China stand up. As a matter of fact, when Mao took to, um, stood on the wall at the Forbidden City to declare the People's Republic 60 years ago, he said, China has stood up. 
And that resonates with every Chinese in the world, whether they're ideologically involved or not. So I think the answer is um, the Americans didn't see a lot of it because a lot of that formative stuff had gone on. Uh, he's been criticizing them. Dixie Mitchell, well, why didn't you get into that stuff? Why didn't you know about the criticism meetings? Well, they weren't invited to them. And also, the Americans were there in the fog of war with the Americans hoping that they could find allies behind enemy lines who would help sabotage the Japanese. The Americans wanted to keep, there were a million Japanese soldiers on the Chinese mainland. If Chiang Kai-shek's troops surrendered, which was always a fear, those trips, troops would have been released to fight our boys in the Pacific Islands, in the, in the, in the uh, Philippines, and maybe uh, hurt MacArthur's chances to go back to Bataan, et cetera, et cetera. So their whole purpose was a very direct uh, military need to assess the strengths and weaknesses and the capabilities of the Chinese communists. It wasn't to do a PhD thesis on the brutality and what went into forming this hardcore group of, of revolutionary cadres. Um, I would also add that uh, we made many promises to them. We made many promises to American Indians and made treaties, and we broke them. And then they went out and scalped some white people. Gee, why did they do that? So what I'm saying is there's a lot of elements that come into what um, creates the kind of murderous, and he was, and he was very isolated. I mean, this man didn't ever get out of China. He was, a, he was from Hunan province, and he became a librarian, so he read a little bit. But he, unlike Zhou Enlai, who had studied in France, he was very much shaped by the isolation and this confidence in his concept of self-reliance. And uh, so that he thought we could have backyard steel foundries. <laughs> and he made everybody in China in the 50s throw their, throw their silverware and their scrap and try and make good quality steel. And the economists and the American trained people are kind of rolling their eyeballs and then they got purged. So I can't explain it to you except to say there are a lot of reasons for it, and he went into excesses, and um, it's tragic what happened. It's tragic for my friends who are Chinese who lived through the great cultural revolution. I have a friend uh, who lives in Ulamuchi, which is way out in the northwest. She's Shanghai-born, and at age 18 in 1958, she volunteered to go to the frontier in what she thought was what I call a, a Peace Corps kind of operation where uh, she would volunteer to go out there and teach for two years and then be able to go home. Well, she and all these other educated youth got out there. And lo and behold, they took away their internal passports so they couldn't go home again. And they were told, welcome new residents. And she was sent up near the um, Russian border to this little town. And she and her husband, who she met, who was also a, an engineer uh, who had gone out to help, and uh, in the 60s, in the early 60s, when they were so paranoid because America was running sabotage efforts with the nationalist Chinese into China, uh, she was accused of being a CIA spy because she had a transistor radio and she spoke English. And she was forbidden to work for the next 15 years and she eked out a little bit of money to help her husband and, and children by collecting cow dung chips that you could burn for fuel. So I, I have no... Um, love for the brutality, and the, but uh, I understand some of the reasons why it might have happened. Yes, ma'am. I'm glad you raised that. Uh, the, the question is, service seemed to be a different kind of foreign service officer who, he spoke several dialects of Chinese, and he lived there, he understood the culture, and what's wrong today? We don't seem to have the same kind of trained specialist. One reason we don't is because of the chilling effect of what happened to John Service and the other uh, China hands. Uh, today, uh, people don't travel on public buses around Iraq or uh, Afghanistan. Uh, and in 1973, early 73, after the Nixon handshake with Mao and the beginning of this rapprochement, the State Department finally held a luncheon in honor of those 
old China hands who'd been persecuted during the uh, McCarthy era. And uh, John Service was asked to speak on behalf of his colleagues. And he told, and I'm going to have to paraphrase it because I don't have the words in front of me. They're back there in my computer, and I don't want to jump over the uh, chairs again. But he, he, in his remarks, he said, America, that, that foreign service political reporting is absolutely necessary as America confronts smaller, less developed, non-white countries with different cultures and institutions. If we keep ourselves in ignorance of potential revolutionary movements, we may again miss the boat. Could have been written today. So believe me, I quote that in this op-ed piece that I hope to get placed in the next couple of weeks. So yeah, it's a crime. But also, it isn't just our diplomats and our foreign service officers who need training in languages. I took my sons, I was on the sister city committee for San Francisco and Shanghai, which were the first two uh, consulate cities. And Diane Feinstein was the mayor at that time, and she appointed me. Um, but anyway, as one of our official exchange programs, I took my son's entire soccer team, 17 boys aged 10 and 11, to play soccer in Shanghai in 1987. And we, uh, we even uh, offered to host a return trip. If they could send us a soccer team, we would house them in our homes, we would take them to Disneyland, and so forth. Well, at that time in, in China's opening, hard currency was hard to come by, and they weren't going to spend it on a bunch of little kids. But I will tell you this. I had eight of those boys studying Chinese for six months before the trip with a fellow from Shanghai who taught them all their soccer terms and important things like where's the bathroom and things like that, um, so that they, it wouldn't be so foreign when they got there. I was stupid, though. I had him learn Mandarin instead of Shanghai dialect, because the kids on the field, you have to speak Mandarin in school, but on the soccer field, you speak Shanghai dialect. But two years later, when, when Tiananmen happened, their mothers said, Lynn, our boys are watching television. They care about what happens there. They know people there. Our education system has got to change. It just has to change. And we're blessed in this country. It's so big. And, you know, I mean, Spanish has become like a second language here. But, you know, there are schools in San Francisco where they speak over 120 languages. And we, we could tap all those people who speak those languages and get them into the schools, I think. Uh, but anyway, we have got to get more serious about being global citizens and not assuming everyone wants to be like us. Uh, if I may, will you indulge me one more anecdote or comment? In the 1990s, American intelligence officers were caught flat-footed when the Indians detonated their first nuclear test. And a, and a commission was formed to find out, well, how did we miss it? Okay? And the final report, Admiral Jeremiah said, you know, we don't have people on the ground uh, who understand the culture, speak the language, or we would have realized that what they had done is they knew when our satellites tracked across India. And they would wait until it went past. And then they would move the material along the roads to the nuclear test site. And he said, the other thing that happens is we don't have people who are willing to try to step into their shoes. We always assume they want to be like us, that they think like us. We need people who are not afraid to express contrarian views. John Service was a man who could step into those shoes. We need more officers like him. And he also understood something that uh, I think is important. That is, all of us, when we view any situation, be it a domestic squabble or an international hotspot, we're like blind men feeling the elephant. So we need a lot of people feeling the elephant. And we also need people, if it happens to be an international affairs issue that I'm referring to, we need people in policy-making and decision-making positions who can see 
the forest, not just the trees and the elephant in the trees, if I can stretch a very bad metaphor. Uh, and I have a friend who was a diplomat during the Bosnian uh, crisis. And he said, you know, Lynn, I had better access from the field than John Service ever had with his effort to get his reports back. He said, I can send emails, but that doesn't guarantee that anyone's going to read them. So it, it, it's a dilemma. Any other questions? Well, I thank you very much. I'll turn the meeting back over to Tony, and if anyone wants a signature on their book, I'd be delighted. This thank is, you. I think you'll agree.